There we go. All right. Um, make sure the recording was on. So we're over 4 million. So that's, you know, at a 28% tax bracket. So we're, you know, we, we're, you know, we paid our taxes. So that that's, that's where we are. But obviously there's some other things missing. We have to live. Okay. So what we also want to see here is that most folks, um, we're spending about 90% of that was left. Now that makes sense because you know we we have to eat, we have to have clothes, we got to send our our kids to basketball camp, we have to you know pay our mortgage, our student loans, and things like that. So that money is literally depleted. But what I'm helping you understand is that money went somewhere. It didn't disappear. It just went to somebody else. Now there could be a good reason why it went to someone else, um, and, and that's fine. Now you may notice that there is still a little bit of green here right at the bottom. And what that is telling us is that the 10% that was left, because you know we did, we we had 28% that went to Uncle Sam, then the balance went to our expenses. You know, again, that's you know, a lot of that is gonna be debt, which I can get into in a minute. But we were able to hold on to about 10% of that income. And we grew it at that same 5%. But you'll see that we're, we're nowhere near the two, three, four, or 6 million that we were before. And this is the first point I want to make. A lot of times we are trying to take the little bit of savings that we have and find some miraculous rate of return that can get us back up to there. But I think you can see from this graph, that is virtually impossible to do. Not necessarily impossible, but virtually impossible. So, and of course we can't live our life without spending any money, having any type of expense. So there's a balance there. But again, I want it to be clear in terms of what the income we have uh, could do and is doing for, for others that we just need to kind of re redirect to do for us. All right, let me see. Uh, okay. All right. So this is kind of one way to look at it. Now, let's get into, let's talk about expenses and, you know, some of the large ticket items specifically that make up the majority or the lion's share of our debt and how that is working against us because we're going to need to understand that in order to just make it work for us. So let's look at, you know, uh, I don't know if some of you I'm sure have had the opportunity to look at an amortization table uh, for all my bankers on the call. Uh, I'll tell you in advance and I've seen a few, I think I saw Gabriel uh, on there. I haven't seen you in a while, how you doing, sir? Uh, I'm not going, I'm trying not to bash you bankers too much because you know, some of, some of y'all are my friends, but, I got to speak truth to power in terms of what's going on here so we can, you know, we can get ourselves together. So let's just look at a amortization table for a $500,000 house um, at a little bit over 4% where we're paying $2,500 a month. So because I really want us to understand where our money is going. We, we saw in the big picture in the aggregate about 90% is going somewhere, but let's, let's begin to diagnose. Okay, I, I think I hear somebody. Please, please mute your line um, uh, until we get to the part where you can ask questions. Um, so here is an amortization schedule. So for those of you who maybe do this a while, you can really clear it, but let me help you for those who don't really understand what's going on. So again, you got the $500,000 house, you're paying $2,500 a month. Very reasonable because you, you have a decent interest rate nowadays. This is actually high, uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. But of that $2,500 that you're spending every month, how much of that is really benefiting you as opposed to paying off the house? Well, we'll see here of that 2500 only $672 for that month is going towards your principal. A whopping 800 
I mean, $1,827 is going to the interest. So clearly most of the money that you pay early on is going to interest. Now, this is probably not a mystery to most people, but I really want us to understand to the level this is hurting us on our journey to building wealth. And we need to have a clear understanding of this before we can change the debt into wealth. All right. So projected forward, and you know, the screen wasn't long enough, so I had to cut it. Let's say we go nine years or so in the future because, you know, okay, Kelvin, yeah, we know it starts off like that. But over time, you know, we start paying more principal than interest. Okay. So about uh, nine years down the road, when we look at our principal and interest, we're, yes, we have a little bit more going towards the principal, about $1,000, but we still have most of our money going towards interest. So that's that $1,400 or so. So when we look at the total interest over these first nine years or so, was that February 2021 to December 2030? So um, we've put in or we've built up in interest or we paid in interest payments just shy of $200,000 in a nine year period. But, oh, let me go back. Um, but the balance on our $500,000 piece of property is still at $400,000. So in other words, 200,000 went to interest, 100,000 went to reduce our balance. So for every dollar we applied towards the principal, $2 was lost to interest. This is the predominant problem that we have um, when we're trying to maximize our funds in terms of building wealth for us and not for someone else. Again, nothing wrong with getting a mortgage. Uh, nothing. You certainly want to pay your mortgage. You want to pay it. But is there another way where we can do pretty much the same thing and not have to pay $200,000 in the first nine years? I mean, if you had the 200000 to the hundred that you paid, you've almost paid the house off already. But according to what's still remaining, you uh you have four hundred thousand to go, so we we all see where this is going. So let me put this in another context context where I think we can uh, understand that for those of us who are in that situation, I don't want you to feel bad. That's not why we invited you on this call because I want you to understand you are actually the the typical person. Um, but let me. I'm going to expound on this a little bit more just to under to to help us understand something. So I want to I want to talk about my credit people, uh, you know, credit repair and all all those sort of folks. Which um, again, nothing wrong with credit. Credit is good, but the argument usually is, hey, if you increase your credit, then you're not paying as much in interest, so forth and so, on, and more money goes to um, you know, to, to build your wealth and that sort of thing. Now, I guess technically that's true, but when you look at it practically, because it really has more to do with how long the terms are, you really don't see that expressing itself in real life. So again, you take that same $500,000 property, my interest rate is a little bit lower, it's 2.8, you know, a little bit closer than what it is these days. So that's a really super great interest rate. But we still see that in addition to the 500,000, we paid in interest another 239. Now we didn't pay as much as the previous, because remember we, were, we had paid almost $200,000 in the first nine years. So here we're surmising that we'll pay 239 over the first uh, over 30 years. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're still paying one and a half times what the property is worth. And over that, and you're still paying, you know, about $2,000 or so 
a month. So it's your while while a lot of your money is not necessarily going to pay interest. The the problem is where is the money that's working for you to build the wealth while you're doing this? Maybe in this argument, hey, we took that other five hundred dollars and put it to work, and that's that would be ideal. So if that's what my credit folks are saying, um, one, I would really appreciate you guys articulating that to folks because we don't want people in the situation where they feel like they need to pay off their debts before they start building wealth. And I'm going to show you why that's a mistake. But here is clear, you are much better off at a lower interest rate, meaning so your credit did save you money, but the problem is it still took you 30 years out of your life that you won't get back. And when we start talking about time value of money, you're gonna see how valuable that is. All right, so let's say again for the folks whose credit is not as good, maybe it's a little bit, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm paying, you know, what used to be a good rate, which was 5%. So I'm literally paying for the house two times. I got a 500,000 in principal, and 466 in interest. So all I'm saying is again, whether it's $300,000 where we are just shy thereof at the 2.8% or five, 466 at 5%, just imagine what that 466 or half of that or a quarter of that could do for you in a, a two or three or 5% interest bearing account over this same 30 years. That literally, could be or should be your retirement, or that should be the wealth that you're building. But we had to do the responsible thing and we paid our mortgage and the banks were able to recoup or make a lot of money from that. So again, we're gonna get into how to change that narrative. So again, let's talk about where your money is going. Again, the national average statistically it's consistent with the first graph that we saw, where most people, the average American is in the 14 to 28% tax bracket. Um, actually, a lot of folks in this area, because we're we we be, because of this region, um, our income seem to be our are, are typically elevated. We're actually outside of that 28%. Some of us are in that, you know, 32, 34%. And congratulations if you are, because that means you're making a lot more money. But this is on average. You, national average, statistical average, 34.5% of our money goes towards interest payments. Now, I hope you understand that now, because now that you see, even though you're paying $2,500 a month in that example, and $1,800 was going towards interest, now we understand why this number is so high. So between taxes and interest payments, we haven't even got to food, clothing, and shelter. We're already over 50% of our income out the door, but going places that it's not working for us. That's, that's, that's part of the problem. So now, of course, you got to live and eat and all that good thing. So that's another 42%. And then last but not least, um, we try to save some money. You know, um, what's that famous quote? Don't spend what's left after saving or don't save what's left after spending, spend what's left after saving. Well, we haven't got to that second part quite yet because we are trying to save what's left after the spending. And again, it's not a knock. That's why this is the national average. So if you're in this situation, uh, I'm not here to make you feel bad. You're like most of us. The question is, how do we change that narrative? Now, for the mathematicians on the call, you guys probably calculate it really quick and say, hey, this Kelvin guy, he's trying to pull something over there on us. Because if you add those up, it doesn't equal 100%. It actually equals more than 100%. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 109.5. So what I'm here to tell you is I'm not trying to pull anything over on you. This is the national average. But what this is saying, like most families are living not only paycheck to paycheck, but they have a credit card balance that from somewhere in the neighborhood of, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I remember my statistics correctly, somewhere in the neighborhood of $16,000 or so 
that goes from month to month. So what am I saying? We're spending more money than we have, and we're using our credit cards, which of course are also debt creators, to pick up the difference. So that nine, that one, that nine percent over and above the hundred percent that we're getting, that is the other problem because we're just digging a deeper hole at a much at a slower rate, if you understand what I'm saying. So here are the challenges that we're up against. And again, we need to try to figure out a way strategically to change this narrative. Um, so let's uh, let let's let's move on to the to the next section. And I, I'll come up here in a minute and take a pause and take some questions before we hand it over to Mr. Psalms. So let's talk about debt. But hopefully I've done a good job to kind of establish that one. If you're having problems, don't beat yourself up and like, hey, I'm the only one. No, you're actually, you have a lot of company. Uh, two, it's kind of the way the system is set up. You know, you borrow the money, you know, banks and other companies, they're banks for a reason. Uh, they make a lot of money. Your, your automobile manufacturers make good money. The credit card companies make good money. The problem is, or the point is, it's our money that we're choosing to give to them based on how we deal with debt. All right, so let's talk about a couple of things here and as we get into it. So next we're gonna talk about good debt versus bad debt. Now you hear a lot of people saying some different things about what's good debt and what's bad debt. What I've heard and have been taught and trained in the financial services industry, and you know, again, I'm a, I'm a, I'm I'm a step on a a few industry toes uh, throughout this call. So for my mortgage uh, brokers and loan officers on the call, I'm gonna I'm not gonna step on your toes too hard, but I'm just gonna let folks know a few things. So one argument is things like mortgage and student loans are good debt. Why do they say they're good debt? Well, they say they're good debt because you can write off the interest. True, you can. And if you if that's your definition of good debt, then I guess to you it's good debt because you know I get a write-off, now I get a break on my taxes, so forth and so on. But um, while I understand that, I, it's, I'm, I'm hard pressed to really definitively call that good debt because at the end of the day, that money is gone, never to return again. I'm talking about the interest. Um, and that you can't really use for anything that benefits you. That's literally money you give to, you know, what are you getting for that interest? You personally don't get anything. That's what the companies get. So when I'm paying, I get a tax deduction, but what that simply does is just another way for the IRS says, well, you can keep a little bit more of the money that you already work for. So I don't, I'm not all that super excited about that. I understand what you're saying, but you know, the using that as a deduction against my earnings, to me, it's like, well, you just give me back money that was really already mine. So I'm, I'm not totally sold on how good that is. It's better than nothing. So from that perspective is good. But um, what I like to tell people in addition to that, and that's not, it's not wrong, you know, you do get a deduction. So that's not incorrect. But to me, what good debt really is, is debt where you are making, that makes you money. Debt that makes you money and bad debt is debt that costs you money. I keep it very simple. So what's the example? If you have a credit card, and uh, you know, and I'm talking to some of my real estate agents here, they'll co-sign on this for you have a credit card or a, a line of credit or a HELOC or something, and you go and use that money on the credit card to uh, put a down payment on an investment property, and maybe you finance the rest, and then that money was able to make you more money, but you had to go into debt to do it, then that's good debt. 
because that debt is actually going to make you money. There's a rate of return. There's a return on that investment. As a matter of fact, it's so good. You have a lot of these real estate uh, investor instructors teaching how to do that because a lot of times that credit is kind of like free money. You know, yeah, I'll have to pay you back the money that I borrowed off of my credit card. But if that can get me a a, a multi-unit or a, a duplex or a single family that I can rent out and make some money, I will gladly pay your money back in order to make more money. So that to me is good debt. Bad debt is simply now I have to I have to pay this back based on my earnings, based on my income, or take some of my investment and pay this debt back. So to me, in as far as my interpretation and this uh, conversation, that is what I consider bad debt. Good debt, anything that's going to make you money. If you're going to borrow some money, do a deal, make some money and pay it back, that's good. If you're going to go out, purchase something, and then you got to you know, work your nine to five or get a side hustle to pay that back, that's bad debt. Why? Because it's not working for you. You're working for it. Okay. All right, moving on. All right, I want to take a little time with this because this is, I'm okay, I'm at 140. So I'm going to try to wrap my section up in about 20 minutes. Uh, this is a concept that quite, I was, I was, and I know I don't look this old, but I was, I was over 50 years old before I heard this concept. And I'm here to tell you, I wasn't happy about it that it was that long that I had lived that much life not knowing what I'm getting ready to show you. Uh, this is kind of the linchpin, in my opinion, of this presentation. Because one of the things I do as a wealth strategist, I help people understand basic concepts and principles. And what I tell them is, if you understand the basic concepts and principles of money, a lot of things from in terms of what we're trying to do, become very simple, very easy. This is one of those pivotal concepts that literally nobody is talking about. It's called the X curve. So let me try to break this down for you as it relates to debt and building wealth. So the X curve concept works like this. It's basically two intersecting curves. You'll see the white and you see the blue. That start white starts from the top and goes down, blue starts from the bottom and go up, but they're aligned. The concept theorizes that a person's responsibility generally decreases and wealth generally increases. So what does that mean? That means if you look at the white line and let's assume that's debt, or another way of understanding is that we're younger. So moving from left to right, you're younger. And as you move to the right, you get you're getting older, whatever old means to you. Um, so generally starting off in life, you have less security, but more kind of responsibilities. You have a house note, you have a car note, you have a student loan, you may even have uh, some kids. You have more of a responsibility, but over time, you want to see that responsibility go down. And a lot of time that responsibility shows up in the form of some sort of a debt, student loan debt, mortgage debt, you know, car note debt. But we want to pay that off. But at the same time, as we get older, we also want to be at a place where at some point in time, when I'm ready to not do do whatever I want to do, you call it retirement or whatever you want. I want to be financially secure. So that's where the blue line comes in. So at that point in time in the future where my debt is low or help, hopefully zero, my wealth that I've accumulated is high. So generally more secure, I've, you know, I've got the house, I've got the car, I'm already paid my student loan off. The question is, do I have, have I built up my wealth? Now, the reason why I want us to talk to this because I see so many people and they even have a term for it who is called asset rich cash poor. 
because nobody's taking the time, the, the five or 10 minutes I'm gonna take with you to explain this X curve concept because it essentially says two things or it says one thing really. What it's saying is that you need to, we need to make a concerted effort to do two things at once. It's not enough just to focus on paying off our debt, despite what Dave Ramsey might tell you. Did I tell you not to pay off your debt? No, but I just, I told you, you don't have the luxury of just doing that. And I'm going to, I'm going to show it to you. So again, let's just understand again, the, 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 the first curve, we want to lower our responsibilities. Again, we have different things starting off, children, mortgage, education, other savings, things we need to do. But over time, you know, we want to pay our house off. We want to pay our car. Off. We want to pay off our, our student loan and um, get those down to where, hey, we're not owing anybody going into our, go, you know, our golden years. So less responsibility than we're over. We're not responsible for owing anybody. That's what we're saying. But we can't forget the wealth side because that, you know, over that same period of time, what we should be doing, and unfortunately a lot of us are not, is saving and investing because I need to build wealth. Because after I've paid everybody their money, what about me? Where is my money coming from to live, you know, in my golden years at the lifestyle I've been accustomed to? Did I put enough away? Did I start soon enough? So because that time for period, whatever time you lose is not going to, you're not going to get it back. So we must accumulate wealth to retire and more wealth and less responsibility. So that's where we want to be. More wealth, less responsibility. My kids are grown. My car are paid off. But that's where we want to be. Unfortunately, too many of us fall short. So let's, let's again, let's diagnose this another way. So let's put some metrics to this so we can really understand. So on the right side, we're going to have some numbers, and that's going to just represent this hypothetical debt that this person has. So, you know, somewhere shy of $300,000. All right, so that's, that's going to be going across. Now at the bottom, we're going to put some years to this, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, and then at some point in time, at the end, let's just say this person is going to be 65, right? All right, now I want to throw you off here. Um, oh well, it's going to show up in a minute. There's some numbers that's going to come up on the on the right hand side, but those are going to relate to the blue line and the wealth that we accumulate or we're hoping to accumulate. But you know what I hear a lot and what I do when I sit down, and work with people, put these plans together. Hey, you know what they say? Look, Kelvin, I love this, but what I'm going to do. I'm going to start saving and investing for my future after I pay down some of this debt. Now, intuitively, that makes sense. It sounds plausible. Okay, yeah, pay off the debt and then. Practically and mathematically, it's a mistake. And I'm going to prove it to you. So let's say, again, on the right-hand side, we have some targets that we can shoot for in terms of building wealth. Because again, after we pay all these folks off, you know, we still need money to live. You know, uh, the, the, you know many people are living way beyond 65. Um, so we understand that we still need money. So let's say this person says, okay, let me pay down some of this debt. I'm not going to follow this to the T, but I hear what you're saying, Kelvin. Yeah, you know, I get it. Yeah, buy, pay down debt, build wealth. Yeah, 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 whatever. I'm going to wait, though, because it just feels like, you know, instinctively, intuitively, I feel like I need to pay down some of this debt before I start saving. So this is what happens to our X curve. It's no more of an X, it's more of a, a, a U or a horseshoe or something. But what does this mean when we delay building towards our retirement. Now, I'm not getting into the numbers yet. I just want you to understand the concept. What that means is when we hit that age where we're much lower down on that wealth totem pole, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, just high, 
two and change versus maybe being over somewhere, you know, up in the between 750 and 800,000. Because the principles of how money grow doesn't change because we decided to wait. It's still about the law of compound interest. So we got to put that money to work for some time. Those of you who have been on my other webinars, I talk a lot about the wealth formula, which is money plus time and rate of return. Well, time is second because time is the probably is the most is the second most important factor. You need to put your money to work over a period of time. So any time that you wait, you waste it. And we see the result with this person. So now the bad news in on and on top of this to add insult to injury depending on where we save or grew this money if it's a 401k or ira or many of these things that they tell us to put our money into we're not even going to get that amount because we got to pay taxes on it so now after waiting so we, we kind of start to see what the cost of waiting is so here's my point let's say we started just a few years earlier and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to drive this point home because I just I see it too much in what I do. Let's say, OK, it looks like this person started. Maybe they were 47, 48 versus 45. Now, of course, this is not uh, mathematically accurate. This is this is an example, but I can show you the math if you'd like. Um, if we're just able to start a few years earlier, what does that mean from a building wealth perspective? That just means that curve hits at a much higher rate. Now, it's still not what it could have been. Seven, you know, eight, seven, 750, 800, 900,000, but it's a lot better than 260. So again, my whole point was showing you this and for, uh, you know, those of you on the call is that unfortunately, and I wish this wasn't the case, but we do not have the luxury of just doing one thing at a time. We just don't. Mathematically, it's not going to work out for you. It's just not. Because there is something called, you know, time value money, which I'm going to talk about again. So I'm going to, I think after this next section, I'm going to start taking some questions before I pass over to Sean. But so as we as we end this section, just to drive this point home, two steps that we need in terms to change debt to wealth is one, we need to have some debt elimination or debt cancellation strategy. Meaning of all this interest we're paying, we need to figure out some way to keep that or not pay as much, but we're not done. Once we figure that out, we must, we have to then, step two, put that money to work where it's growing or being invested. If we don't do those two things, this webinar will have done you no good. It's okay to not pay the debt or find a way to reduce it, uh, but we got to put it to work. But also, we really don't have time to waste. We really can't afford to say, hey, I'm going to wait, pay this debt off before we start number two. Sorry to break it to you. We just, we just don't have that luxury. Wish we did, but we don't. The math is what it is. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support what I just said with this concept. And I want, this is something else that people really need to get um, really need to get an understanding. I'm gonna give you an example. I'm trying to think of one when we talk about the time value of money. Um, and this is huge. So when we, when we talk about the time value of money, I will give you an example of what um, something that happened in my life. I remember it was, um, there's a couple of examples. Let me just give you one. Sometime, you know, I probably was somewhere in my late 20s, mid 30s, somewhere in there. And I had invested in a, a company and the company, you know, hadn't really taken off yet. It was just, you know, the whole idea was to leave that money there to take advantage of, 
of the time. You know what? I'm going to switch that. I'm going to do a better one, something that we can all relate to today. Um, let's talk about Bitcoin. Um, I think it was earlier last year, I invested in an opportunity of Bitcoin when Bitcoin was $10,000. Okay. So, you know, now Bitcoin is close to $50,000. So, you know, I'm sure everybody's like, oh, wow, that's great. You know, Kelvin made a lot of money. But the question is, did I? Because it's not that Bitcoin went, is five times more valuable. Is what was what? How much did I put in at that time? And then what is the value of it now? So again, time value of money. So if I put in, if I bought ten dollars of Bitcoin, then that means I have maybe somewhere close to fifty dollars. I still got that five hundred percent, but you know, ten dollars and fifty dollars. That's a great return but it's still not a lot of money. Now, if I had invested $10,000 and I have 50,000, okay, now we're talking about something. But the point is, so it's not what I invested or what I invested in terms of a loss or, you know, or what I should have, man, had I invested this, is what you invested could have turned into. So let me bring it back to this with debt. So let's say you were that person who had an opportunity to invest in Bitcoin last year, but you didn't have $10,000. Now, again, of course, I'm not telling you to invest in Bitcoin. It's very speculative. It's very volatile. I, and if you're going to invest, I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to maintain the mantra, which is invest what you can afford to lose. So, And that's what I did. So it wasn't $10, but it wasn't $10,000 either. I do know some people on the call who did invest $10,000 and they're feeling pretty good right now. Um, but the point is, let's say you, you know, for whatever reason, your money was going other places and you didn't have that money or you hadn't structured your finances to the point where you had money set aside where you could take, a, take advantage of that, that opportunity. So again, time value of money. So it's not the $10,000 that you didn't have. That's part of it. But it's what the $10,000 would become, in this case, a year, two, or three years in advance, but in a normal situation, 10, 15, 30 years from now. So I buy a, a Gucci bag or a Dolce & Cabana or, Michael, you know, or, or Nike shoes for $300. I'm not telling anyone what to do with their money. I'm simply saying, is it the, the the issue is not the $300 that you spent or the $600 or $800 you spent on the pocketbook. If Hey, if you have the money, again, I'm not telling you what to do. None of you are my clients that I, well, a few of you are, but anyway, you know what I'm saying? What you really lost was what that 300, that 600 or $800 would have become five, 10, 15 years from now, had you done something else with it. That's the time value of money that's working against you. So let me go through this part and then pass it over to you. I got a few more minutes to my colleague. So let's talk about two people. One gentleman is called Mr. Start Early. And then we have another gentleman who's called Mr. Wait Longer. So Mr. Start Early, he heard you know somebody say hey start saving early and that's what he did about three hundred dollars a month he didn't really know why he just put it away somewhere where he was getting eight percent and he you know he put his 300 away so that's 3600 a month and he did that for a little while and then of course life happens he's like hey i can't put this money away anymore let me you know go do these other things. I want to buy a house. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to get married, whatever it is. And he stopped. And he was over time, that money continued to work for him to the point where, you know, after what is this 20, <clears throat> 23 years or so, he has over a hundred thousand now. So that's fine. But let's look at Mr. Wade Longer. And again, this is the correlation between how, hey, let me, Mr. Wade Longer was like, let me pay off some debts first. 
And then I'm going to start saving just like my buddy, Mr. Star Earl. So, you know, he's paying off his debts and all that sort of stuff. And then a couple of years later, he starts saving the same amount of money at the same account, getting the same interest. But he literally has to put in over twice amount, uh, twice the amount over that same period of time that Mr. Star Early had put in, in order to get close to or just pass what his good friend did. 25,200 versus 61,000. So the question becomes, what is the cost of waiting? I showed you the X curve and we saw it in one sense. But this is here just showing you, again, the numbers of what it costs to wait. Waiting is not ever going to be a benefit for you, for you when you're talking about money and putting it to work for you. Because time is one of your, your, your greatest features. And again, no one here knows how much time we have. So would that simply mean we need to start as early as possible? There was a... Um, there was a, um, a saying that I heard on, you know, one of the other many presentations that I'm on, and then someone asked the question, when is the best time to plant a tree? The answer, 25 years ago. That's the best time to plant a tree, because if you planted 25 years ago, you'd be here now. When is the second best time to plant a tree right now? Because the time is not, it's only going to get worse the longer you wait. So hopefully I've driven that point home so we can understand, again, if we're interested in changing debt to wealth, fortunately or unfortunately, however you decide to look at it, we don't have the luxury of waiting. We must, back to the X curve, we have to figure out how to do two things at once. And that's, again, what, what we are here to help you with. So um, last point with Mr. Wait Long and Mr. Star Early, because I, I got a little problem with Mr. Star Early, because he started off right, but he, he apparently didn't really understand the wealth curve, of the, the, the X curve the way he needed to, because what he should have done is try to figure out a way or adjust his expenses or his income or maybe not buy that, you know, the, the, the 2021 car, maybe get you a, 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 a 2017 or 18 or 19 and keep that 300 a month going because what did he lose? Even though he, he did better than Mr. Wade Longer, what if Mr. Star earlier didn't stop? And he just kept doing the 300 over that 23 years at 8% accruing. He would have had almost twice the amount, just shy. So, so what did it cost him from starting doing the right thing in the beginning, but then losing that discipline and not continuing? This is the time value of money. This is what it cost him to not keep it going. He, he lost out on an additional uh, 100, you know, he could have had 240,000, which is 111,000 more than he had, even though, you know, just for saving for that short period of time. So I hope everyone understands that. Now, so with that being said, let's take a pause before I turn it over. We're in pretty good time, right at two o'clock. Uh, Valerie. Do we have any questions that we can address before we hand the mantle to Mr. Sons? We do, and actually they're great questions. Uh, question number one is, isn't saving and investing instead of paying down debt only the better choice when the expected ROR or return on, on our uh, investment is greater than the interest rate on the debt. Okay, so I'm not a good enough mathematician to really go into that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you back to the wealth curve because we get this sort of thing. So one, it's not an either or conversation. It's an and. You don't, you, again, we don't have the choice of saying, do we, can we do this or that? We have to do both. I think I just showed it to you. 
you when you now if you want to do a mathematical formula and find out if one is better you know we're, we're actually going to talk about that later about how that can be done but literally you would have to do the calculations and it would be like well how 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 much is the other day how long is it you know what's the interest rate those sort of things so i, I want us to kind of get away from you know either or i'm an and sort of person i want my cake and i want to eat it too but you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this with the full knowledge of it's not easy, but it's a it's a principle for a reason. The X curve is telling us something that we need to figure out or to the extent we can, how we can do both. So that's that's how I'm going to address that question. If you want to do the math and figure it out, but I don't think there's any any wealth principle that says one is better than the other. It just depends on how the numbers shake out. Uh, Valerie, any other questions? Yes, and you really did uh, address this already, but I will share it with the group. So it says, you know, in this example, it does not show the debt that Mr. Start Early still has not paying it down as did Mr. Wait Longer. But you just addressed that by saying you need to do both at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so again, Mr. Start Early was uh, just someone who uh, got in his ear and just said, hey, you know, and we've all probably all heard this, hey, save your money. So you need to save your money. So he probably didn't know why he would save his money. He was, you know, probably at the age where he probably didn't have a lot of debt, or maybe he didn't, who knows? I know some people who have a lot of debt at that age. I know other people who have almost no debt. So he's just socking away $300 a month because, hey, what else am I going to do with it? Um, but yeah, the concept being time value of money the sooner he started he was much better off than someone who started later because they 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 lost the the leverage or they lost the uh function of that time value because they started later so by starting later it actually cost them over twice as much just to get to the same point that's let's just assume the debt was equal on both sides. At the end of the day, one person still had to spend twice as much of their money to get to the same point of somebody else. That's just not smart money management. Valerie, next question. That is it for now, Kelvin. Thank you. Well presented right. again. Okay, awesome. All right. so. I have the distinct pleasure, and I'll be coming back to close this out, but I want to switch over to Mr. Sean Soms. Um, Sean Soms of Soms Enterprises. Sean is a financial professor and activist with the uh, National Financial Literacy Campaign. He educates and empowers people and communities on financial knowledge, including access to various wealth vehicles at no cost to their his clients. Sean educates people how to better manage their finances, mentors individual and business owners by teaching them the concepts and principles that need to build that they need to build a strong financial foundation. Um, the reason Sean is here today, because in addition to all these great things that you see that he has done and is doing, he has made a concerted effort to be laser focused on the debt cancellation and debt elimination question for folks within our community. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let turn it over to Mr. Psalms and let him um, take over this section of the presentation. Sean, can you hear us? I can hear you well, Kelvin. All right, sir. I will turn it over to you. Fantastic job, sir. Um, and thank you, Valerie, for being here also. Valerie has an incredible voice. My goodness, I, I'm gonna need you to do some radio with me, sis. Uh, uh, Kelvin, you talked on so many points, partner, and I thank you for even setting this up, this forum, for us to know better. And I have this saying, if you knew better, you can do better. And messing with me, you gonna learn today. Because in our community, so much of us, we know how to make money. That's one thing we know how to do, we're rich. One thing a lot of us are not is wealthy, where our money is making money for us. 
because we don't necessarily have the access or know where to go. So who am I? What do I do? I'm really just somebody who's hungry, trying to, trying to tell other hungry people where I got the free bread from. Because what I learned, I did not learn this in high school. I did not learn this in college. I didn't even learn it in my church. I had to learn it from someone who took this wisdom and shared it to me. And wisdom withheld is wickedness. So therefore I put my life to fight for others, to be the change for them I wish somebody had done for me in my twenties. Not gonna worry about the regret. I say, you know, um, you don't cry up a spoiled milk. What you do is you wipe it up, you buy some more and you don't do it again. And let's keep it moving forward. So everyone, what is debt? Let's talk about the word debt first. Debt is actually a state of owing. And in America today, debt has become a way of life. It's so cliche now when we say the word, um, and what, what's it called when you uh, desensitized? Yeah, I got a little bit of debt. I, I, I owe this, I owe this. It's like, this is the way things are supposed to be. However, I look at the word debt as slavery. I'm bound in bondage to something that's over me. And if we're talking about American debt with our credit cards, with our, our mortgages, car loans, student loans, things of that sort, it's meant to hold you. It's not meant to release you. You have to fight your way out of debt. But the question is, how do we do it? If I hit the lottery, yeah, sure. I pay my way out of debt. But again, I told you debt, I see it as slavery. The opposite of slavery is freedom. And everybody who's listening right here, I'm telling you straight up, freedom has a price. Slavery and bondage has a cost. And most of us are so comfortable paying the cost. We're not even, it feels normal. I'm speaking to a few of you who want to experience freedom. Now, we got to understand this too. I love that uh, Kelvin put this up here, strategies to pay off the debt. There's a misnomer that says knowledge is power. I stand to you flat foot, 10 toes down and tell you that's a lie. Knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is power. So some of you, I hope none of you, but some of you may, you know, this was a really, really good uh, uh, forum. Uh, thank you, Kelvin. This was great. And go about your day and go about the year doing the same old thing. But some of you, I'm really rooting on you that this will open your eyes and you will move differently, shift, take a pivot in what you've been doing and do something new. All right, so my screen is up, my screen is up. Oh, I have to tell you one more thing. So uh, I, uh, I used to be a gospel, well, I, I still sing. I'm a gospel recording artist turned financial financial education empowerment activists. Because I realize there are a lot of people who will say this term to you. Watch my fingers, watch my hands. I'm good. How I'm, how I'm brought up, are the people around you good too? Or is it just you? Does it sit and stay with you? Or are you active to do something in the community, if not just the community, in your family, your nephews, your, your godchildren? Your, 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 your cousins, to sit them down and teach and show them a better way. My song of 2021 is Whitney Houston. I believe the children are the future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a chance. And I stand, I stand with that. And I want to see others like me. But if I got to go by myself, I know I got some help in Kelvin. So let's, let's move forward. All right, so da, da, da. I think I need control, Kelvin. Um, are you do, you, do you have your PowerPoint? Oh, okay, I got yeah. it. I, look, look, you know, you know how old people are on laptops and Zoom. Okay. <laughs> I got it, I got it, it's good to go. All right, so again, there are strategies to paying off debt and eliminating debt. The strategies are 
not just wanting, but how do we go about getting free of this? So there's, there's a couple of them. Actually, there are eight of them. There may be a little bit more, but we're going to talk about eight, but I'm going to show you one, and then I'm going to show you another, okay? So debt roll-up. Debt roll-up is one. If somebody can let the individual in. So what debt roll-up is, debt roll-up is actually a mixed hybrid of different methods, it's, it's like up in the air, it's, it's dealer's choice of how to address the debt, whether highest to lowest, lowest to highest, uh, highest interest rate, highest, uh, uh, lowest uh, time on this debt. It's, it's dealer's choice. That's one way people do things. Then there's another called debt snowball. Dave Ramsey is very famous for this one, whereas uh, it can take 10 to 12 years, if not more, where you target the lowest the lowest uh, uh, debt by amount, by the lowest balance, pay it off because you want to see some small wins. You want to see those small wins. Reason why this is probably so popular because just like working out, if you worked out and you didn't see any results in a year, chances are you're not going to stick with it. But if I see me some small accomplishments, it makes me want to move on to the next because I see it can be done. However, it can take a glacier pace of doing so. Debt avalanche. So this is about the same thing. And this is starting high. So this is going to the highest interest rate, knocking down the highest interest rate and or the highest balance. That can be your mortgage. So if we start right there. Ugh, it can work. But the timing, most people won't stick with it because they want to see some immediate results. All right. Then there's also FinTech technology, applications and softwares that can do it for you at a breakneck speed. Using algorithms, our GPS system is an algorithm, Facebook is an algorithm, your phone is a bunch of algorithms, your, your ring system to get into your house is a bunch of algorithms. These things work on your behalf by doing all of it. I call it playing chess with your money to get you out of debt, eliminating all your debt. And when I say all your debt, I mean, including the mortgage. Those, uh, we have a couple of real estate agents and brokers on the line. I took French back in 10th grade. I never forgot it. I took it because I was trying to woo the women until ain't nobody understand what I was talking about. <laughs> but I've never forgotten it. So I still speak it today. The first four letters, M-O-R-T, means death. Mort means death. And the chances are without mortgage, you're either going to die within that 30 years trying to achieve that deed, or you're going to refinance within the first seven years or so, or you're going to sell that property. Meaning the chances of you actually getting a deed in your hand is either going to be at your debt before your death or after death? One of the two. How many, I want you guys to ask yourself this rhetorical question. How many of you know anyone who owns their home? I mean, owns it with the deed in hand. Maybe very few and in between. Maybe great granddad, grandma. Maybe we happen to an inheritance and people paid out, but very, very few. How many do you know are actually buying their home? We call it buying, but really, we're simply glorified renters because you don't own a thing. You st stop paying one payment, stop paying two, three payments, see what happens. Yeah, they come after us. So let's pay off, let's have our mind on getting out of debt, being debt free. All right, so debt roll up. Let's see what that looks like. Debt roll up, the effects of this is you have all your creditors, your your home loan, your, your line of credit, whatever that is, uh, that could be a student loan, your, your vehicle, your credit cards, your, your purchasing store cards, furniture, and miscellaneouses. And so we have our balances. Are you guys aware that most people don't know how to reconcile a checking account because it hasn't been done? Kelvin and I, we can attest to this and we, we are honored to do it, but we sit down with our clients and we make, we pull up everything. We want it all on the table, like financial nurses. 
I want to know everything you owe, everything you have, how much interest is being paid on it to the point. Every single penny that's owed, I want to know. Why? Because of this. Money. We don't look at money as money. In, my, in the Psalms house, we don't. We look at a $5 bill as five employees. And its purpose, its purpose is to make me five more. Now, the effect of it is I can spend it, I can give it away, I can transact with it, but its purpose is to make more of itself. In the, in the apostolic and Pentecostal church, we call money a seed. And a seed has to be sown in order to grow into a tree. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen, but that's all right there. <laughs> so we look at money differently, therefore we treat it differently to be good stewards of what we have. But having such a balance, our home, our car notes, our um, line of credit, our student loans, and the credit cards, that balance looks intimidating. The interest rate, look at the interest rate, how it averages, how it goes up. The monthly payments, and these are just minimum monthly payments, and the remaining payments. And then the real debt monthly payments times the remaining payments. Yeah, it, it gets a little scary. But how does debt roll up work? The effective way is, so you take the smallest balance. Remember, we're going for small wins on debt roll up, right? And we see how long it's gonna go for, how many, the monthly payments in total, as well as the remaining payments. And what we do is we add an extra $100 to that debt. So if your minimum of this, uh, let's go to the Macy's. The Macy's car is 150. Your minimum monthly payment is $25. Unfortunately, so many people are comfortable paying just the minimum because they're just comfortable having, not owning, simply having. And that's where I said the bondage is the cost. It's going to cost you in the long run. But this $100, putting that extra towards your 125 and now we're paying it off quicker, all right? So the new payment amount is down 125. So now originally, if you had gone the minimum payment, you would have paid on this Macy's card for 6.4 months. Now, since we're adding more money to it, we're hitting it at the core, it'll be paid off in a month and a half, month and uh, two weeks. Small success, small wins, right? We don't finish there. So now we take that 125 and we take that also and add that to the minimum payment of the target card. So now we're paying 150, okay? The remaining payments are normally 25.4, knocking it out this way, knocking out the extra interest and hitting the payment. So you're paying some interest, but you're knocking out a whole lot of it and you're actually targeting the core of that thing. So now it's being done at four, four months and uh, 4.7 months. I have to pause right here. I've been given a gift to break things down to the minutia so that a five-year-old to a 95-year-old and everybody in between can understand what I'm saying. So there's a preacher I know, her name is N. Cindy Trim, and she said this, and I'll never forget it. She said, we have word recognition, but very little word comprehension. So we've heard a word, but what it means, I can't necessarily define it. So I took the time to sit back and analyze the word interest. What does it mean exactly? I see sometimes they say 1.3%, um, um, your car notice, three, four, five percent, something like that. What does that mean? And it came to me. I share this with you so I can share through you to somebody else. Interest means a free extra gifting of money. Now, if you're being paid interest, that's a free extra gift of money on top of your money to you. You be, unless you're at a bank where you're only being paid 0.01% interest, but hey, it's something. Your money will grow a couple of extra pennies. You didn't do anything for those pennies, it came, all right? But interest works in the opposite too. If you're paying out interest, that's a free extra gift of money from you 
to somebody else. They didn't do anything for it. You had to borrow and you had to pay interest. What if you were in a position where you didn't have to pay interest? Oh, how beautiful would that be? And so that's why I want to say when, when we're talking about interest, look at it in that way. All right. So we're knocking it out so we don't have to pay it so we can retain it and save it. OK, next one. So now we're going to take that 150 and add that to the Sears, the minimum payment. That one, uh, that 25 plus the 150 is now 176. And you see so on and so forth. Look how we're knocking it out. You just keep it going. Keep it going. And especially when you get to your car, you feel super good. You now own that car. You got that title. And then we take all that money and we move it towards our home. All right. And look at the payments. The payments are different and the timing is different. So we're just putting $100 extra towards this debt. Now, the debt snowball is good. However, it costs $100 a month. Some people say, it, well, it's free. No, look at that again. It costs $100 per month. So $100 a month is $1,200 a year, right? $1,200 a year times, let's say it took you 15 years to pay off your mortgage. That's, that's $18,000. Now, guys, tell me that doesn't sound good. Hey, it may have cost me $18,000, but all my bills are paid in 15 years. Now, I'm going to give you the true, true skinny of it. People don't have discipline. We're in debt for a reason. We're in debt because we have lack of discipline when it comes to spending. I told you I'm a singer, so I'm going to rhyme every now and again. I'm a lyricist. <laughs> but yeah, that spending thing, because we thought the purpose of this was to buy and trade where that's incorrect. The purpose of this is to make more of itself for me. But we have this spending culture in the United States. I know people who make $300,000 a year. When Corona hit, they were in the food lines with everybody else because they know how to spend, but they don't know how to save, let alone know how to grow. If we look at money as a seed, look at it as agriculture, make it grow, but you got to plant it. Like Kelvin said, plant it today, water it, grow it into a tree where it, it, um, the tree gives out fruit with plenty more seeds and sow them also. Eat some, sow some. Never spend your money. Spend the money that your money makes you. All right? So this fintech software, guys, we are in the age of information. Not only can you do it yourself. So my previous line of work was called Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners. If you guys remember that back in uh, the early 90s, I sold Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners. And when I had to get to my destination, we had the paper maps, the huge paper maps. So I had me a book. I used to buy this book every six months. This book was $40 and it had all of DC, Maryland, and Virginia in it. Scroll it down, find out where I had to go and I'm driving by the maps. Now we have a much more user-friendly way of doing things, GPS. Technology has now come to our aid. Not only is it in your phone, not only is it in your home, now it's also will work for you for your money. All right. So to use software program, there's there's a couple of software programs out there because I'm really, really grounded in this. I can show you the fakes from the reels. There's a lot of, well, I'm not going to call them fakes. I'll, 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 I'll pull that back. Some are knockoffs. May get the job done. I'm not certain. But I do know the ones that will. So we sit down and we actually show you a plan to have an algorithm, computer algorithm, play chess with your money. It doesn't pay the bills for you. It tells you what to pay. Another way of looking at it, look at it as a financial physical fitness trainer. You say you want a six pack. Okay. I know how to get you a six pack. What I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do the work for you. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm going to show you how to eat how, what not to do, how to do it correctly. And we're going to achieve this goal if you do what I say on this date. 
So we use computers for everything. Use the soft software program that computes the optimal time to leverage your money and cancel, cancel interest and pay off all your debts in record time. So it sounds simple, I know, because like I said, some people may want to do the debt snowball. Some people may want to do debt stacking, which is target and focus on one bill. You select the bill. The other one may be debt laddering. Debt laddering is going after the highest interest rate and uh, debt roll down. Like I said, that's the, that's the hybrid. Um, but the software does it for you because one thing I know about people, and when I talk about people, I'm talking about me. Arithmetic and math are not the same thing. Nope. I know you probably thought they were. You're like, Sean, how is that so? Arithmetic is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Simple, simple arithmetic. However, math is, math is percentages, calculations, ratio, ratios, and formulas. And the truth be told, people don't like math. They don't like math so much, they'll pay somebody to do the daggone math for them. <laughs> because it's too much of a headache and I don't want to get it wrong. So why not use an algorithm that does it for me? And these algorithms are made specifically regarding money, interest, balance, elimination. All right. So uh, has uh, I love that part. Uh, the formula has millions of lines of code, many different algorithms working hard for you calculates the money automatically as well as the elimination date. So we want to leverage this software or softwares to do it for us. Banks have relied on math and timing to make money for work for them. This is the funny thing. Everybody's making money off your money. The IRS is making money off your money. Banks are making money off your money. Credit unions are making money off your money. Credit card companies are making money off your money. Everybody's making money off of your money except you. When is that going to change? Now it's your turn to bank like a bank and make money work just as hard for you as you are working for it, all right? So again, these are the other four. So software uses more than eight money-saving strategies. And here's just four of them. Interest flow. So interest flow is a combination of uh, your, your line of credit, any type of line of credit, to leverage that money to strategically cancel out your debts. So we're, we're doing musical chairs with the money and we're putting it back before the music stops. That's one way, get out of debt. The second is interest cancellation, making a larger payment towards the principal to cancel thousands, thousands of dollars in interest payments. Remember, we don't wanna give away any extra money. So our goal is to knock out this interest that would go to them and now save it in my pocket. Got to put up, got to put something in here. If you're saving that money. So I, I met with a young lady who was looking to refinance her house. And I asked her, I said, why are you refinancing? She said, cause I want to capture the lower interest rate. I said, okay. So how much money is that going to save off of your mortgage? She said about two, $300. And then I asked this key question. What are you going to do with that extra two, three hundred dollars a month? And she said, um, oh, go, go, go on a trip somewhere. Um, get me a new wardrobe, all this stuff. And again, that's the spin culture. I'm not judging her because she didn't know any better. And neither am I sitting in my self-righteous pool podium, but I'm seeing I gotta save her from herself. And I tell her, I said, dear, are you aware? that refinancing this house just to capture the interest rate, the shiny little thing. Oh, that's pretty. 2.3 interest, interest rate. You don't even know what that means because you don't know how to measure interest unless you know the rule of 72. If you do that and you do that on top of your balance, you know, yeah. But she's looking at the shiny thing because everybody does it. You are restarting your mortgage, mortgage, the death note, back to square one. Yeah, you save $200 off your mortgage, but you ain't nowhere close to owning it. And the likelihood is you will not. So we got to know better to do better. Don't look for extra money just to save unless you're going to do something with that money. 
Okay, so the interest cancellation, if we're going to save interest, what are you going to do with the money you're saving? Put it in our pocket or put it to work for us. All right. Strategic payoff, strategic payoff. That right there is the system determines mathematically which debt to pay that will eliminate the most debt at that time. So, again, you're you're leveraging the intelligence of the software, those who wrote it, how it works. I call it a grandmaster playing chess. I, I love the, the TV show on Netflix called um, um, Queen's Gambit. Man, that was an incredible show. My son and I, we play chess. But when you play against a grandmaster, oh boy, now you is, is using every type of technique possible to win the game. All right. And then there's velocity banking, velocity banking, uh, using a HELOC, your home equity line of credit or cash value life insurance policy to strategically cancel out that debt. So there's a lot of methods you can use. If it's too much for you to do, get someone or something to do it for you. All right. Just like a GPS. Can I, can I jump in here real quick? Just because um, you, you sure. hit on that I wanted to talk back to an earlier. Let me go back one. No, 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 you're good. You're good. Okay. There was a question earlier about, is it better to pay off, uh, invest in something that's gaining a certain interest versus paying debt? And I think the point that I wanted to highlight here is that to really answer that question, you would have to you you need to use that, that some calculus to really mm. find that out. Because there's just too many variables too many. To, to say, Yes or no? Quick example, because um, I was just looking to read this up. Let's say you have you have a mortgage, you have a uh, a line of credit. The lot the mortgage could be at six percent. The line of credit could be at ten percent. Let's say you have fifteen thousand dollars on that line of, of credit. You can take five thousand dollars from that line of credit and pay mm. off a part of your mortgage at six percent. Now, Matt, just by looking at it, you would think, hey, that's not going to work out because the line of credit is more than the mortgage. But that $5,000, to your point earlier, would actually knock out over $20,000 of mm -hmm. interest. Yep. And the much amount you're paying on five $5,000 at 10% is like, what, $50 a year or something? So you got to do the math. You can't just make assumptions based on the interest. So sorry. For, uh, thank you for allowing Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelvin. And a lot of people, they actually want to double up their payments because they assume. See, when you're dealing with math, you need to know exactly how much is coming off, how much is going in, how much interest am I saving, how much when I when I'm saving interest, what am I going to be doing with that money? You have to know. But a lot of people shoot in the dark by putting extra money in. I met with a client. She said, I'm, I just put an extra hundred dollars in to um, to my mortgage. I said, but what is it doing? I don't know. <laughs> I just got a hope and a prayer. I know it's doing something. That's not good enough. You, This is your money. Nobody wants better for your money than you, unless you don't. So let's get closer. Let's become detectives of our money. Because I'll tell you one thing, you go to McDonald's somewhere and they forget to give you your dime back, you, you pitch a fit. <laughs> but mortgage companies are just taking our money left and right, top loading, top loading the loan towards the front where 80, about 83% of your payment is going towards interest, free extra gifting of money because you don't know no better. You're going to learn today, all right? So every single aspect of your financial situation comes into account. So these are the questions that the, the GPS system is going to look for. Do you have multiple streams of income? Why? Because it's going to leverage this money, these employees, and put them to work for you. One thing about money, y'all, money, employees, it don't go to sleep. It don't get tired. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It don't take a vacation. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't complain against you and talk behind your back. It's willing to work for you if you give it a job. But so many of us, we have so much money sitting in the doggone checking account. Lord, Lord have mercy. Or in a savings account, not paying us even a penny of interest. That's like having a 
handsome, six foot three, 250 pound muscular man just sitting on the couch. Want to work, but ain't got a job to work because ain't nobody giving him a job. Wants to work. That's its purpose. Where purpose is not understood, abuse is inevitable. Miles Monroe. So we got to do better. So this software, again, will add, do you have any uh, multiple streams of income? Whether that's down to your 401k, whether that's down to your, 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 uh, 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 your savings account that your grandmama gave you. Is your income commission base? These are variables that a lot of people can't figure out, but the software will. How much do you owe and for how long? Are the interest rates fixed, adjustable, simple, amortized, or compounded? Anticipate what's coming down the road, vacations, holidays, spending, tax returns. Oh, this is, this is an awesome one I love about the programs that we use. It also sets up a very healthy emergency fund for you. We say pay yourself first. But you know who that depends on you to pay you. You are your first bill, not Pepco, not, not Toyota Financial. You are your first bill because if you don't take care of you, who's going to take care of you? Not them. I guarantee that. Unexpected expenses such as medical bills uh, 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 and so, so very much more. So the summary helps eliminate all of your debt. So there's a saying. A mind that is stretched to the size of truth can never go back to its original shape. All 32 of you on this line, I want you to imagine being debt-free. Imagine it. What would it look like after being debt-free? Paying off your home in five to seven years because the algorithm has written it in your favor. So all your debts are clear. One thing you better not do is get back into debt. Know how money works. Now we're gonna take those, those un, unassumed paychecks every single month, and now we're gonna build wealth. We call it from debt to wealth pipeline. Transcend generational curses of saying, I ain't got it. I only have some of it. I wish uh, pressing likes on Facebook where if they say, if you like this right now, God's gonna bless you. No, he ain't, God don't do that. God wants you to be a better manager of your money. And we need to put in action. Faith without works is absolutely dead. We know the scriptures, but how many of us are trying to live by them? Let's eliminate all the debt in your entire family in a fraction of time. Helps you make educated financial decisions. You're only where you're living because of the amount of money you're making and the amount of debt you have. Your kids can only go to a certain amount of school because of the amount of money you have and the amount of debt there is. Debt matters and it, 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 it dictates your way of life. What if there weren't? All right. In many cases, improves your credit score because now your, your debt to income ratio is nothing but income. You own everything. Yes. So I'm also the leader of Team Exodus and we I have, a, I have a consortium of professionals who are with me and we speak to debt like how Moses spoke to Pharaoh. And we say, debt, let my people go so that they may freely worship in the land, the promised land of wealth. There's nothing stopping you. You've been praying for a long time. You've been saying for even longer. Now that it's here, we are in the era of information that can DIY do it yourself or get something to do it for you with some help. There's no excuse. First of the year, and I'm done, Kelvin. First of the year, people have two resolutions. I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to get my money right. I can help you with the money right one. Losing weight, I can refer you to somebody. You can use it on multiple houses. So this is where the mind is stretching. Don't just own one house. Mm -mm. I know your grandmama never owned a house. I, 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 know, I know daddy and big mama never owned their house. You can. But I want you to look past owning one. 
I want you to own multiple houses. And under these softwares, you can put each house up under the software to eliminate that debt, pay it off, change the amortization chart, uh, uh, the formula, rewrite it in your favor. So you own your house free and clear in five to seven to 10 years, depending on how much discretionary income you have. Not doubling up your payments, not, not refinancing, not reverse mortgaging, nothing wrong with those things. It just depends on how you're using and what you're using, your motivation for them. But this uses none of that. You have to qualify for the programs. That's the other thing, all right? And uh, uh, like I say, using it for multiple houses, you need to see where you want to be. Stop settling. You make enough money to do whatever you want to do. But like I told my son, my 17-year-old son who works at Olive Garden, he gets tips. I say, son, $5 can make you a fortune if you put it in the right place. Look at money differently. And I, I end and close with this. Two scriptures, Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Not lack of money. Not even lack of ability. Not even the lack of wanting to do better. They just don't know. What if you knew? Final, and I'm done, Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where there is no guidance, the people fall. But in an abundance of advisors, there is victory. Thank you all for allowing me to share. Hopefully you feel my heart because I want better for you. Why? Because you deserve it. And others do too. Starting first with mine. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, so as we get ready to... Um, close out. Let's do this because we have 15 minutes. Um, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do this last section and then we kinda, we're going to uh, take questions because I want to um, follow right up on, you know, the great presentation that Sean did to really clearly articulate our next step. So let me, um, let me go ahead and go to here. So um, let's kind of take it all the way back and really understand where we're having this conversation about going from debt to wealth. Um, we already established that, you know, there are multiple ways, the strategies that we can use to pay off debt, but I think everyone would agree to the extent we can pay it off faster, that just means more money for us to go to work for us that we can put to work. So the question becomes, how do we can put it to work? Now, Sean talked earlier about, you know, using it to buy other homes. I have, I specifically want him to address that because I know I have some of my real estate investor clients on here and I have some other clients who are interested in doing real estate investing. So that's a, another conversation we have. There's actually a video where we're gonna play uh, but we're running a little bit long. So I will, you know, for everyone who just sends us an email or follow up, I'll send you that video so you can look at it is how some of these softwares actually help do the algorithms to calculate, hey, if I pay down my first house and I have X amount of equity in it because I'm accelerating these payments, I could take this money and buy another property and do it again. Again, the, the, the math on this, you, you know, you need a room of accountants. And that's why I kind of answered the question I did earlier. It's, it's we, to, to Sean's point, this is something you don't want to make assumptions on. You want to run the numbers. Just run the numbers and the numbers will tell. It's just math. That's all it is. And you'll, you'll, it'll be simple. So again, there's two opportunities. We want to take the money and put it to work. But like I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of waiting. So we really need to do these two things at the same time. And we really need to understand to an extent how to do that. So I'm going to talk about just real quickly, um, another option in terms of ways to put your money to work, because the next level to this in terms of building wealth, which is, you know, uh, I could do a whole nother hour presentation just on this, and I have, 
is you don't just want to build wealth, you want to build tax-free wealth. So mm-hmm. we'll, for those of you who follow up with us afterwards and you know we, we do a discovery call, we can get into the weeds of that. I just want to keep this very high level. So let's talk about tax-free wealth for a minute because in addition to everything we said, understanding the X curve, understanding we, you know, the, the, the primary job is we need to eliminate debt as quickly as possible, but we also need to build wealth as quickly as possible. Otherwise, we could potentially, based on our X curve, we, time is not on our side, so we could potentially run out of time if we wait too long. I think everybody who's been on the call from the beginning got that. So let's now talk about taking that to another level where we are talking about tax-free wealth. Because again, to my uh, my earlier point, even if you are to build wealth under the normal or the more readily uh, promoted tools and and, and financial instruments, more often than not, you're going to have to pay taxes on that wealth you built. So it's kind of, again, that two steps forwards, three steps backwards. So let's quickly talk about the concept of tax-free wealth, and then we're going to take questions. We're going to end it, and we'll talk about how how we can uh, follow up or work with those who are interested in taking this conversation to the next level uh, offline. So really quickly, let's just talk about taxes, something that I'm sure most people don't like talking about. I actually like talking about it now. You heard my story about earlier on with the IRS and losing Uh, large sums of money. Now that I know this, it's a conversation I like to have. So long story short, there are only three categories where your money uh, can be from a tax perspective. We need to understand this. You'll hear the terms taxable, tax deferred, tax advantage, layman's terms, tax now, tax later, tax never. So when you look at a tax now category, because we're talking about building wealth now. So when you put your money to work, You know, either you're doing real estate or you're putting it to work in some sort of financial vehicle. So that's why this is important. So if you have it in a tax now, which is generally things you get from the bank, um, checking, saving, CDs, whatever rate of return you get on that, you get a little notice at the end of the year from your bank saying, hey, uh, you gain X amount in interest. You need to send this to your accountant because you need to pay taxes on it. So that's tax now. Tax later are 401ks, 403bs, uh, IRAs, annuities, pension. While that money is growing, it's not being taxed. But when we later on, when we withdraw that money to use it, it's being taxed later on. So this is a situation we're not paying taxes on the seed, to Sean's point, we're paying taxes on the tree. Again, I'm not going to say that's a bad thing. That's just the way they are set up, but we need to know that. But then, of course, there's tax advantage, also known as tax never, where we have things like a Roth IRA, 529 college saving plan, municipal bond, health savings account, cash value, life insurance, and long-term care benefits. Now, there are some real high-level strategies. Sean just touched on the one where you're using a HELOC. Um, You know, and if you guys want to go online, I'm going to give... Again, do some research. Be 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 somebody who's you know thirsting for this knowledge. Go on YouTube and look up, and you'll have many many videos. Velocity banking. Go on YouTube and look up uh, infinite banking IBC. Go on YouTube and look up. You might want to just type in how to pay off my mortgage with a HELOC, and there'll be a whole lot, bunch of videos that come up that'll do probably you know. They'll, sp- they'll be able to spend more time on that than, than we are. But I just want you to do that to let you know all of these strategies we're talking about is information that's already out there. The question is, which one is best for you at which time? And that's what you really can't determine on your own. Short of that, hey, do debt roll up. You kind of know there's there actually is another nugget I'll give you. There's actually... Uh, you could go online and download an Excel spreadsheet to take all of your information, type it in, just like Sean showed, and you can do a debt roll-up strategy, and it'll do the calculations for you. You don't have to do anything. 
Or you can do the debt avalanche, which is what if I paid off the highest interest rate first? And you will see the difference. So, but you're going to fall somewhere in that 10, you know, 10. Well, it just depends on how debt you have. But for most of my clients, I see them in that 10, 11, 12%, 12 year range. Um, so if you want to get in that five to seven to nine year range, you got to use uh, some sort of a, 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 a application that's going to just crunch these numbers and it'll just run these scenarios uh, because you know it's using computer technology um, and then that's that's where you're going to get that additional three four five years where you'll be out of debt because again unless you had a room of account you just can't do the math uh, quickly enough with all the variables to really figure it out to be optimal now maybe you don't want to be optimal all right so back to tax now tax later tax never when you uh so the last category is tax never so to the extent we can we want to while we're building wealth while that blue side that blue line of the x curve wouldn't it be nice to have that growing in a tax never environment so now whatever number i get i don't have to pay taxes on it because that just means now i strategically figured out how to keep more of my wealth all right so let's talk about how that's done um when we look at places where we can put our money or places where we can get a rate of return or places where our money can work for us, some sort of you know investment rate of return, they also fall into three categories. First, you have fixed accounts. Second, you have variables. So let me talk about these two for a minute. Uh, fixed accounts are unfortunately today, we're not getting a lot in terms of our rate of return. There's somewhere between zero and 4%. Again, a lot of things we get from our banks and that sort of stuff. So that's checking, saving CDs, not paying us a whole lot. Generally set up ideally for people who already have a lot of money. So even at a low interest rate, you're getting a pretty high income of, I mean, you're getting a high return in terms of dollars. If you have five, $10 million sitting at 4%, that's a decent amount. If you have $20 sitting at 4%, not so much. Variable, this thing's in the stock market. We know it goes up, we know it goes down. You know, uh, Corona's taught us that, the market breakdown in 2008. So again, those are stocks, bonds, you know, mutual funds, variable annuities, 401ks, things like that. So we don't really know what we're going to get. Fixed rate, we have the safety, but no growth. Variable, we have growth potential, but no safety. But there's a third category, which is called index. Uh, Warren Buffett talks a lot about it. You can Google it. He's very big on index, ETFs, things of that nature. Um, so specifically, when you talk about index products, uh, it's a situation where it allows you to Eliminate the loss. Warren Buffett's two rules of money goes as follows. Rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. The only instrument that follows that specific instruction is index, which is probably why he talks about it a lot, um, where you can have an uh, index product where your floor is as, uh, as high as 0.75. Some of them are at zero. And you can go your your cap or the ceiling. The, the concept is based on a floor or a ceiling or a floor and a cap. Uh, your cap or your ceiling is 15%. So what that essentially means is that the market goes up within the indice that you pick, 5%, congratulations, you get 5%. Market goes up 10%, you get 10%. Market goes up 15%, you're doing great, you get 15%. Market goes up above that. 20%, 30%, 25%, you're, you stay at 15% because that's your, your ceiling or that's your cap. So in other words, you're always making money, but you're not, you're just not, you, you never lose anything. So again, from a building wealth perspective, that's very attractive because I could have my money in a variable and maybe I'll get that 25, 30, 40%, but I also get that 25, 30, 40% loss when that happens. The market always corrects itself. Again, not saying don't put your money in the market. Plenty of my clients have their money in the market. 
we're talking about how to more most efficiently change debt to wealth. So if we're going to be efficient about it, we're not trying to take any losses. So that's one. Uh, and the other thing is we want it to be tax free, which I'll get into in a minute. Now, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here just because I want to get to our questions, but I just want to give you guys a graphic picture. I'm a visual person. I told you my background was architecture. I always do better with a drawing or a picture in terms of communicating. So what we're seeing here is just what happened in the market between basically 2000 and 2012, 13. You know, 2000, we had a dot-com bubble. 2001, 9-11, we know, most of us know what happened in 2008 with the real estate. So just showing the Mark, Val, the kind of the last cut, the last time where there was a pretty volatile period in the market. We're going through one now, but we haven't come out on the other side. So, you know, we can't put a slide together because, you know, people are talking about we're due for another crash this year. So who knows? Uh, but this is the last one we can kind of um, document. So if you had your money in a 401k, 403b, something like that, you're kind of taking the ups and downs. If you had your money in an index, it would look like this, because as the market goes down, you're going up 0.75. Market goes down, you're going up 0.75. So even though you're not making a lot of money compared to the person uh, who's in, who has their money in the market, you're doing a lot better. Because while you haven't made a lot of money, this person has lost almost half of their money. So again, if I'm trying to build wealth, that's probably something I want to avoid. Um, so the market goes up 25% because I have a cap. I can't get 25%. You know, today it would be 15. Uh, this slide is actually showing a more conservative number at 13.5, but I think you guys see the point. I still get a significant amount because I got it from, from the point of where I left off, which was I was still making money. Now I'm just making a little bit more. So as the market goes up, I'm still getting the, the, the predominant of that upside. But when the market goes down, I still go up. So at this point, you kind of see what's going on in terms of, you know, this person is taking a little bit of a roller coaster ride up and down, up and down. While here, I'm, I'm on a steady upward track. I'm on a steady upward trajectory. Uh, it's just depending on the time, I'm going to make more money than others. So we want to leverage something along this line. Why? If we go back to the X curve, where we know we got to do two things at once, we really don't have... You, in our mind, we convince ourselves, okay, I have time, but we really don't because of the time that every day you wait, every month you wait, every year you wait, it's, it's causing you dollars on the back end that you just haven't seen yet and that you'll never see. So we got to figure out some way to do it. But now if we can do it even more efficiently, maybe I can make up for some of the lost time that I've already kind of gone past because I've waited to this point. So that, that's the point I wanna make here. And then if we could structure this to where this is not taxable, then I'm even better off. So as we close, I wanna just talk a little bit about how, two slides and we're done, a little bit about how this part works in comparison. So most of us have heard of the Roth IRA. If, they, if you haven't, I'll just explain. The Roth IRA is a type of individual retirement account where the money you put in it is after tax dollars. So it is another, it's a type of investment. It's in the market. So you can lose, you can make, you can lose. But generally speaking, you know, depending on the type of funds you have, you should be making pretty decent money, um, but your money is still at risk. And you know who knows what you consider decent. For some people, six percent or five percent is decent because it's it's a lot better than losing twenty percent. Um, so just some quick rules: Roth IRA is in the tax never category. Uh, so that means it is some place where you can put money 
that you're trying to build for wealth that, hey, once this money grows, I don't have to pay tax on it. So that's good. However, there are income limits for the Roth IRA. If you're a single person and you make $139,000, you cannot use the Roth. If you're a couple and combined, you make over $206,000, you cannot use the Roth. So they, it's a good program or it's a good uh, instrument, but if you make too much money or at some point when you make too much money, you won't be able to utilize it. Um, in terms of what you can contribute, it's also limited. You can only put in 6,000 a year. If you're under 50, you can put in 7,000 a year if you're over 50. So again, I'm bringing it back to changing debt to wealth. We wanna eliminate the debt. We want to, we want to start the process of eliminating the debt. But we also need to start the process of building the wealth because we can't afford to wait. We don't have any time to waste. One of the ways we want to explore doing that is in a tax never environment because now we don't have to worry about paying 20, 30, 40% on the back end depending on where we live and depending on what taxes are at the time. I don't think there's anybody on here who has a crystal ball, but if you do, please let us know what taxes are going to be in 20 or 30 years or even less when many of us retire. We would certainly appreciate it because that will help us plan even better. But since we don't know, how about we avoid taxes altogether and not have to have that conversation? Um, again, it's being a, so again, it's an after-tax contribution, meaning I paid taxes on it, I paid taxes on the seed, not going to pay taxes on the tree. So, so going back to the index now, the instrument that we can use that's going to take advantage of the index that I showed you earlier is not the Roth IRA, but it's something that it's a, a terminology that the industry has created where they call now this is not the real name, it's called the rich man's Roth. Why is it called a rich man's Roth? And to Sean's earlier point and to the point of where we looked at tax now, tax later, tax never, and we saw cash value life insurance, it is utilizing one of those that, that strategy of cash value life insurance. So now all the money that grows inside that is just a way for us to make it tax free. But again, it's a tax never product. There are no income limits. So however much money you make, you can use it. There are no contribution limits. It's only limited to how big the policy is. So if you want to create a policy where you can put $100,000 in there, you can. If you want one where you can put a million dollars in there, you can. They're not going to limit it to you, but it essentially works the same as a Roth IRA. Just think of it as a Roth IRA kind of on steroids. Again, after-tax contribution. But to the extent where it separates itself from the Roth IRA, it follows Warren Buffett's principles, never lose money. That's the floor and ceiling concept. You know, also we can get a pretty good rate of return, annual rate of return up to 15%. So if we want to build wealth, you know, if I can get that higher return and not have to pay taxes, that's even, that's a good thing. Um, when we get into tax-free withdrawals in terms of 59 and a half, those rules don't apply to us. Now, of course, if we're building wealth, we don't want to do a lot of withdrawing from this uh, 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 fund because we want to want it to build money, but it, we can do that. But we also have that tax-free retirement. And, you know, I throw this in here for some of my um, attorneys and and my real estate agents on the line, others, some, some doctor uh, clients I'm, I have, it's also judgment proof. So separate conversation, but as a wealth strategist, one of the issues is asset protection. So this kind of allows you to do that as well. So at the end of the day, you want something, since we know, hey, we got to do two things at once. I got to find some money that I could put together now to work for me while I'm using some of these strategies to pay off my debt. And as I pay them off, depending on what strategy I use, maybe I can add more money, but I can't just afford to do one thing at a time because at some point 
from a wealth creation perspective, I'm going to run out of time. And it, and it may not mean I'm not here. It's just that I don't have enough time for my money to go to work for me to get the result I want. So I'm here, but you know, there's a there's a, a adage that we have with the with the the trainers that um, myself and Sean work with, where they said one of the first things you talk to your client about is what if you die too soon, which is obviously the insurance. Um, conversation. But the other thing is, what if you to live too long? Well, what is living too long? What living too long really is, is waiting too long to build my wealth and basically outliving my money. That's what that earlier X curve showed you. So with that, we're going to pause here uh, and we thank you guys for your time. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, Valerie, if you can let us know if we have any questions before we go into, uh, before we uh, close out the call and let folks know what the next steps are. I don't see any calls right now or any questions right now, Kelvin. I believe everybody is just uh, mesmerized once again. <laughs> Good well, job, Kelvin and Sean. <laughs> hopefully they're not too mesmerized that they won't take action. So, um, so with that, what I'm doing, I'm putting our information up here. Feel free to take a screenshot. Let me tell you about what's going to happen moving forward 